Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. And for also thanks for the nice introduction. Uh, I hope everyone can see my um, screen. Uh, so as uh, Paul said, my name is Gabriel. I'm currently well, at the Sheffield School of Architecture and the uh, Delft um, uh, um, University of Technology. And yeah, thanks for the organizers for giving me this opportunity to present the research I'm developing with Corolla Hein at Delft. Uh, I'm very happy to be for in Australia for the first time. So thanks a lot for this, again, for this opportunity. And of course, thanks to Sodira who agreed to switch time slots as I have to literally fly after uh, my, my presentation. So um, my uh, our current research deals with the role of militaries and military personnel in spatial development during the 20th and 21st century with an emphasis on decentralization and, this, and suburbanization, but mainly with an emphasis on, on its global relevance. Because historically, the military camps and defense infrastructure uh, or just military personnel uh, were in separate part uh, of urban history. So we know that walls, garrisons, uh, bastions, barracks, and bunkers were not just simple spatial artifacts, but rather key factors in shaping our cities. But what we will be claiming in this presentation is that in the 20th century, with the birth of the nation state and the, the, its um, citizen based military, the so called nation army, uh, that this role began changing. Because with the citizen based army, two main processes started taking uh, place. One is the formation of a new military caste, a new military civil political elite, and the other is the formation of the home front, where also normal citizens were, even if unwillingly, part of the military. So these two aspects had an important impact on the process of global suburbanization and decentralization. And in this presentation, we will address this issue, explaining how it began and continued and even continues to evolve. We will be doing this by examining a series of chronological military decentralization initiatives during the 20th century and also 21st century in different global contexts, eventually explaining also how the military and its uh, considerations were simultaneously the means, but also the ends of these endeavors. But first, we have to look a bit to go back to, yeah, to look to the historical, I mean, the real hist wide historical context, because in yeah we can never uh, divide uh, uh, this totally yeah the, the military and the civilian uh, aspects because if we go back 4000 years ago we see that human settlements usually began also as uh, or, or were shaped according to um, uh, um, military considerations or defense considerations as we see in the example of uh, fort hills that which were typical to the Bronze and the Iron Age. So then we see that the, these spheres, they say we, on one hand we had the civilian sphere and the other one we had the, the military spheres. So in terms of urban planning, we can say that historically, at least 4,000 years ago, these two spheres were uh, inseparable. And even if we go a bit onwards to the so-called yeah, father of urban planning, uh, the Hippodamus plan, so these two spheres were also inseparable. I'm not talking about the, um, the resemblance between urban and military camps and whether the, it was the first that followed the, the latter or the other way around, but rather that the main class to occupy these towns, as Hippodamus himself mentioned, were the class of warriors, which then basically meant the official citizens or the only official citizens in the Greek polis. This essential connection between the civilian and the martial continued also in the Roman Republic. It began to change with the formation of the Roman Empire as soldiers were no longer uh, merely citizens, but later as it expanded, it turned into recruited mercenaries um, that were based in the castrum. So there was Rome proper and there was the frontier. And entering Rome, one had to give away one's arms before crossing the Rubicon. So at the same um, time, discharged soldiers were giving the lands to settle frontier areas and to expand the empire, and leading this, what we know as um, Roman villas, surrounded by farmlands and natives of the barbarians. The, the successor of this, um, of, the Roman, uh, of the Roman Empire, 
what we know as um, European federalism, continued with the separation uh, between the martial and civilian spheres, with the first being mainly an interest only of the ruling classes. For the serfs actually didn't make, it made no difference or no difference at all, whether they were ruled by one uh, feudal lord or the other. So this division brought to the inflation of castles all around Europe during the Middle Ages, uh, which highlighted the, this uh, divide between the civilian space and um, the armed one. This, as we know, began to change a bit, to crumble down during the Renaissance, when we see leaders coming back into uh, putting their, say, not, not really castles, but no more their palazzos inside uh, the city centers. But uh, yet the presence of militaries in cities continue to form a separate entity, repeatedly used mainly to crush down civil disobedience. Yeah? Think of Paris, the Dresden, or Odessa during the 19th century. Um, but what we see that with the nation state, uh, its nation army, this meant that the separation now between the martial and civilian spheres were now obsolete. And this really began being shaped in the 20th century. Uh, but the problem is that now the civilian population turned into also into a target. Um, we see that in the urban destruction that characterized World War II and the new forms of civilian fortification that were not there before, like communal, private, and even individual bunkers. Um, so decentralized, decentralization turned into a defense mechanism, protecting the civilian population by scattering, uh, scattering it along the country, but while also fortifying the state's control over space. Um, so this reappropri reappropriation, as we know it, yeah, is, uh, uh, areas by populating them with the desired citizens, um, this, of course, merged with a new mode of production, uh, and the interest of the industrial cap uh, capitalism to expand the limits of capital uh, in what uh, Lefebvre referred as the production of territory by the state. Um, we can say that what we're claiming here is quite similar to um, uh, this, uh, this new military thought, yeah? Merge, merging it with uh, capitalist endeavors and, and using sometimes also military personnel as the spatial agents that simultaneously deserve better housing, uh, but also the ones that uh, instigate or facilitate further development. So it sounds quite similar to settler colonialism, um, or European settler colonialism in the 19th, 18th century, and even in the 20th century. But what we're talking here mainly took place within the borders of the nation state. Um, one of the first examples that we can see in let's say military housing projects um, for the for, for the nation army were was in Britain and following the the Boer War the Second Boer War, uh, but these began as efforts to take care of disabled veterans, um, and these were mainly private initiatives like the one by Douglas Haight, uh, which led to the Douglas Haight Memorial Homes that is actually still functioning and precisely for this purpose, but along the years, so on, it's more into a real estate company. And at the same time, um, British um, uh, garden designer Thomas Mawson took this a bit uh, further in his book from 1917 called An Imperial Obligation. He presented the vision for a series of industrial villages, which quite resemble, let's say, the garden city ideals of that time. Um, but they still relied on what he referred to, uh, referred to as patriotic philanthropy. So we're merging the need to settle um, the, uh, disabled soldiers um, with industrial considerations, but not really developing it. So it's something that we're taking care of them, not really using them to develop things. Um, however, after the war, after the Great War, this uh, turned into an integral part of the British government's intentions to stimulate the construction industry, which st uh, stood still. And what Lloyd George uh, famously uh, quoted as uh, providing uh, homes foot for, uh, fit for heroes, referring to the many soldiers returning from the Great War. So not only disabled ones, but all, also regular ones. And uh, through substantial governmental subsidies following the Housing Act um, from 1919, 
um, yeah, this led to a series of suburban low-rise, self-contained communities of relatively high building standards, much better than at least what they were before the war. Another country following the Great War in Poland uh, during the same years, veterans, mainly those decorated with medals and awards, uh, received state-owned land par parcels in the country's eastern frontier. Um, these settlers, uh, referred to as uh, Osadniks in Polish, formed the state's tool to expand its control over areas it annexed following World War I, uh, mainly with uh, current um, uh, uh, today's uh, border area in the Ukraine and also in areas which are currently in the Ukraine. Um, but on so to the other side of the globe, in Japan, which was ruled then by a military elite, a more drastic approach was taking place. And the, the military rent industry, mainly um, airplane industry, its factories and workers formed the main fuel in the urban development of Tokyo during the 1920s and 1930s, which doubled almost uh, even more than doubled the population of the external ring around Tokyo. And um, in, less than, in less than 10 years, this brought to the birth of the Tokyo metropolis area, which replaced Tokyo City. And as a means to facilitate, uh, facilitate this transformation, the areas between 30 to 50 kilometers from the city center um, formed what was referred then to as the industrial control area with, quote, uh, newly industrializing cities, unquote. This did not only influence Tokyo before and during the war, but also following it with the, the attempts to reconstruct Tokyo uh, after its uh, total destruction. Um, and the post-war plan of, of the Tokyo metropolis prepared by uh, Ishikawa continued the, the pre-war vision with single functioning cities and even followed the air defense, uh, bo um, bombardment defense measures of these green belts that separated uh, one area from um, the other. But this was, so military industry decentralization, suburbanization was not only um, uh, a Japanese idea, because in the US, during the pre-war era, um, the military industry vision, um, uh, what yeah, Eisenhower would later refer to as the military industry complex, was an integral part of uh, Eisenhower, uh, of um, Roosevelt's uh, New Deal. So, just like in Japan, the government's efforts focused on developing factories for the defense history, uh, industry and large-scale housing projects to settle their workers and their families, uh, forming this new and parallel uh, public housing system for defense uh, workers and military personnel, while also stimulating the national industry. This is constantly one of the most important uh, uh, factors in these uh, efforts. Um, and unlike the image that we usually have, you know, these uh, military bases, uh, uh, th th these new projects were much more suburban, much more um, and, um, uh, well attained to. So, so Aluminium City, which uh, in, um, uh, uh, in Pennsylvania was, was planned by uh, Breuer and Gropius, I think appreciate at least their their uh, architectural abilities um, um, where just was precisely planned for this um, for this purpose um, but this link between military personnel and suburbanization in the US received a significant boost mainly after World War II with the GI Act uh, that helped veterans in receiving affordable mortgages and played them yeah which played them crucial role in the development of American suburbanization as we know it today. Yeah, what um, what yeah, could be termed as the dormitory of, its, of the American middle class, uh, but eventually yeah, facilitating also the emergence of the nation of homeowners and the idea of families living in so-called dream houses. So this suburban vision became the US, became America, became the free world, and, but also a product, many a product that the US would begin to export to areas under its influence during the Cold War, with the military sometimes uh, forming as the exporter. Uh, one of the best examples is uh, Berlin, uh, where uh, this is Grunewald Berlin, um, 
where the main housing estates of uh, the US uh, Berlin Brigade were uh, placed. But one of the areas mainly for Iraqi officers uh, was, uh, unlike all the others that were planned by local architects, this was planned by American architects, um, which was, let's say, the most performative uh, project, the, the Dreipfuhr Siedlung. Um, it consisted of small, uh, small number of low-rise suburban houses following this American-style uh, West Coast uh, bungalows of one-story uh, suburban houses, quite modern, with, of course, the American car at the entrance. And this typology did not exist in Germany at all before the war. And we can see a starkening difference between uh, the American houses and the German ones, the pre-war ones with the tilted roof surrounding them. But the interesting thing is that following this, um, this uh, neighborhood that was built in the 19, uh, early 1950s, uh, as we said that this topology didn't exist in the Interbau um, uh, exhibition less than 10 years later, it was well, this topology suddenly became one of the main topologies of the exhibition. So you can see that the military, and one cannot say that it was merely a coincidence. Yeah? This military was now a cultural agent uh, promoting American ideals and this global war of ideals, mainly. So the role of the military and the military personnel as privileged spatial agents was not reserved only for the so-called free world. Um, so not, it was not only an, an American concept, but it also, we can see similar precedents yeah, east of the curtain wall. For example, in, in New Belgrade, uh, at the same time, actually late 50s, uh, military housing projects from one of, from the substantial part of expanding the city uh, while, while with the military receiving its own and upgraded housing estates, which were significantly better than the ones for, let's say, normal citizens. Um, and this, um, but also, this is was not just uh, um, um, an example for uh, uh, for Belgrade or nor for Berlin nor for the U.S. Because we can see this same pattern in other places, and I think the most ex um, extraordinary example, at least in the 1950s, was in Israel, which in that time was somewhere between, let's say, the socialist and the capital sides, and even a bit leaning towards the socialist one, was when less than a couple of years after the establishment of the State of Israel, um, the new Ministry of Defense launched a series of housing projects meant to serve uh, acting officers. Um, these as well were significantly better off than all other projects known then, like the example of Moz Aviv here in the image, designed by Zev Rechter, one of Israel's most known architects at the time. He actually received several prizes for this project. Um, but this was not only a way to, let's say, uh, treat military officers in a better way, but also this corresponded with um, the attempts of the state to control areas it annexed, or former Palestinian areas surrounding Tel Aviv, it annexed in the war and to expand Tel Aviv uh, um, uh, eastwards, not only uh, northwards. Um, so in that sense, we see that it does also correspond to, let's say, um, settler colonialism within the state. So expanding control, why um, uh, giving this privileged class a better housing system? Um, and one of the best examples, actually, that took place at that time is Kiryat Natseret, uh, but later known as uh, Upper Nazareth, which formed the first phase in establishing a Jewish settlement on the hills of the surrounding Arab one, uh, Arab Nazareth, uh, the means to control it. Um, so this project was also designed by one of the main architects at that time, the, the Israeli architect, Ariel Sharon. Um, it was designed for uh, officers in the newly established Northern Command, um, and it exhibits actually quite quite exceptional design, at least for that time, this local-based modernism with the use of local stones and the patio houses, which was quite unique, at least for this, let's say, uh, strongly socialist Israel of the 1950s. 
Um, there were several initiatives that took place in that time, but this costume started to hold, but re-emerged in the 1950s, in the 1970s, sorry, uh, as a way to um, redevelop uh, fading municipalities or poor municipalities, bringing in uh, military officers, offering suburban uh, projects as a way to enhance, let's say, the local population, like in the development town of Yavne. But later in the 1980s, uh, this turned into a way to uh, enhance Israel's control along the border with the occupied West Bank, as we see in the projects built for military house, uh, for military officers in Al-Fem and Ashe or Shine, and the most perhaps best example, Reut, which was much more suburban, let's say, um, family lifestyle oriented in comparison to the ones that we saw in the socialist, um, somehow with Spartan dwelling in the 50s and 60s. And here the military side began, uh, began to go, taking the role of a uh, real estate de de developer and even an entrepreneur and a role that increased in the 1990s and 2000s as it began evacuating its bases and city centers, turning them into high rise buildings like the example of uh, the, uh, the main Israel, the main defense uh, um, uh, camp or the main uh, camp of uh, uh, the military in Tel Aviv, which is was placed on the the former German colony, the Templar colony, hence which were deported to Australia, by the way, uh, during British rule. Uh, but and then it turned into an Israeli defense uh, uh, military in the midst of uh, in the middle of Tel Aviv in the 1990s and the 2000s. This turned into a real estate gold mine, which the military thought of evacuating to um, build real estate. Basically, the thing is that uh, the, the initial the the incentive to preserve the German houses, as we can call them in the middle, was only at, done after the military understood that the high rise buildings surrounding the preserved um, buildings would be uh, sold much better, meaning that. So this form that we have here of the old house in the middle and the towers surrounding it with the military towers on, on the right and this, uh, the residential ones on the left is a form that was dictated by the in, the the interest of the military industry to increase its fundings. So this, this we see that this transformation now is turned into, from, let's say, um, caring for the, the military personnel to caring for the military budget. And on the other side of the border in Egypt, we can see a much better example. So Egypt, which was, which is still uh, ruled by the military junta since the 1950s, um, the army and its different construction companies began taking greater civilian role, becoming one of the largest entrepreneurs in the country during the 1980s, developing housing projects for military officers, but also for the civilian population, and slowly turned into a real estate, uh, these the real estate projects, with well, the highlight being New Cairo, built on lands owned by the military, which will include now the, under construction, the main governmental buildings, embassies, universities, museums, and around five million inhabitants. Uh, we see in the, the Ministry of Defense area on the left corner with the headquarters of you know, different sections, as well as the military and defense forces, uh, but also defense ministry. One can wonder where they got this octagonal shape from. Um, and the headquarters are surrounded by the, uh, the housing districts for military and defense officers, uh, according to ranks and um, and uh, um, yeah, so some more prestigious, some less prestigious, going with some simply reduced to really exclusive villas. Uh, and this is the area that was developed directly for the army. The other is the, the, uh, developed by the army, but for where it develops the um, uh, infrastructure that then sells the parcels to offshore investors, mainly from the Gulf, um, leading to this yeah, series of gated communities, which expand, let's say, the capital into the periphery while forming a new layout uh, of urban uh, exclaves and enclaves, but all as a means to legitimize the rule of the military on the one hand and to boost its budget on the other. And here was that wrapping. And so to say that in conclusion, what we had here is now is, you can see that this evolving 
role of the military in the past 90, uh, 150 years. So taking a leading role uh, or, uh, in, yeah, in global suburbanization and decentralization. So expanding cities towards the periphery according to the transforming economic and uh, political agendas, yeah? whether as Keynesian mode of caring for our soldiers or this forest idea of developing industry or fortifying political rule, uh, territorial expansion, real estate speculation, or just political legitimization. But anyhow, we see that militaries play an integral part in this process of planetary improvisation. And um, mainly what's interesting here is examining these local implementation of this global phenomenon. Yeah? We were able, by doing so, we were able to grasp this new layer and even a new framework in analyzing and understanding the overall relationship between the state, the nation, its market, and the process of uh, spatial production. And uh, I will finish with this nice image and let you guys ask questions if you have any. Th th thank you very much, uh, Gabriel. Um, really interesting, uh, as we were chatting just before uh, things started, um, Really, I was really interested in this uh, coming from Belfast, where military settlements have been imposed into kind of urban landscapes, uh, but they're peripheral sites. Uh, they're peripheral in a kind of socio geopolitical sense for certain communities, but they're centralities for other communities in 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 the Northern Ireland context. So, so excellent uh, overview there on that kind of larger scale and not international scale. So, um. If anyone's got any questions, uh, you can raise your hand or you can put it in the chat in the chat box. It'd be great to kind of see if you've got any questions. If you can stop sharing your screen, Gabriel, that would be really yes. helpful. I stop. And then I'll be then I'll be able to see everybody. So uh, well, maybe I'll, maybe I'll just abuse my position as chair just to kind of maybe raise a comment. Um, just uh, yesterday and uh, the, these concepts of kind of blandscapes, blendscapes and brutalscapes have come up in our discussions and thinking about certainly the, the kind of the morphologies uh, that we are finding in uh, different types of uh, peripheral centralities. And I think a number of the ex uh, examples that you showed there, for example, the military ones, which were uh, quite regimented in their form and their structure, uh, the Egyptian one in terms of their uniformity, in terms of their aesthetics and stuff speaks to a, a certain kind of blandness in some senses, you know, dep depending on what, what way you're looking at it. So um, would you like to kind of respond to those kind of concepts in some way? Well, um, I think what could be one of the things that we can say about militaries is, see, militaries are in, in a sense similar to universities, in the sense that uh, there are these um, uh, really like the most, let's say, international um, uh, bodies that we can think of. Yeah? Each country has its own military. And militaries are usually based on this the same model, yeah. Just like in in, in the universities, we have faculties, we have departments, we have professors, we have lecturers. Yeah, they change sometimes. Uh, uh, an assistant professor is one thing in one context, and assistant professor is something in another context. But it's 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 based on the same hierarchy. That's and then we 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 learn from each other. Yeah, and this is the same thing that uh, this is what they do in the militaries. Yeah, they they. They send officers to study in that academy and they come back and they do drills together and they do seminars together and they, they work together. Sometimes they cooperate, but everyone has its own military and it's usually um, so it follows the same patterns. And what's interesting is also to see, let's say, how militaries of, let's say, former British colonies are usually, uh, uh, they usually follow the same model of the British military, meaning the same ranks, et cetera, et cetera, but it's the same other things, yeah? So ex-British colonies will also have the same, let's say, um, um, uh, court system, the same prison system, yeah? So these, so it's no wonder that many of, let's say, uh, the concepts are very global, 
in terms of, but also in terms of morphology. So if the uh, Egyptian military does its, uh, uh, its um, uh, new headquarters as replicas of the American Pentagon, it's not by chance. Uh, it's, they, uh, they, they, they got this inspiration somewhere, but they got the inspiration from the uniform from somewhere, they got the inspirations from the rank from sort of somewhere. Uh, in, uh, in Egypt, they have a rank of field marshal, which is not an Arab word. Uh, you have to get it from somewhere. But so these are things that, um, so I think this is, so it's not only just uh, the mechanism itself, but it's also copying some, yeah. um, some aspects physically copying them.